But today I'm going to be preaching on the topic of dressing modestly. Dressing modestly. So I'm going to give you some principles in the Bible of how you can determine modest dress. So I thought I would preach on this because oftentimes when you have younger Christians, obviously this applies more to women, but when you have younger Christians in the faith, sometimes they just don't know what the Bible teaches about modest dress and they're trying to think, you know, how should I dress? Some people are even thinking about how they dress. You know, as Christians, we should think about how we dress what clothes we put on, how we present ourselves, because even though what's more important is the heart, it is important how we present ourselves. Now, obviously this topic applies more to women than it does apply to men. I mean, men need to consider how they look, but really it's not a a masculine attribute to be overly concerned with how you look. And really, if you're, if you're a man and you're overly concerned with how you look, that's a very feminine attribute. That's what the Bible calls being effeminate, which is a sin, as opposed to females being feminine. But females ought to dress modestly. And we're going to look at scriptures and principles of how to dress modestly. So this sermon is going to be more applicable to the women But men, don't tune out because you need to know these principles because one day you may need to teach your daughter. You you may need to give a sister in Christ advice if she is not here for this sermon. So like I said, it does apply more to women than it does apply to men. And men that are overly concerned with their appearance are being feminine. Now you see these days... I don't know if you see this trend these days with men, but nowadays, you know, men are getting into like, you know, collecting shoes. You know, men are into like wearing fancy clothes. I see on YouTube there are like channels just dedicated to men's haircuts and men's styles and how they're gonna trim their beard all nice and fancy. Honestly, I find that stuff really effeminate. You know, and then even there are Christians these days, they get into the the skinny jeans with the fancy shoes and they want to cut their beard all nice and fancy and do all the... To to me, that is just... That's that's guys being influenced by homosexuals and then trying to, you know, be pretty. Pretty boys. You know, that's why, you know, manly people make fun of these guys. They call them soy boys. I don't know if you've ever heard that that, that phrase where it's basically you're a soy boy because you can't even (laughs) drink a coffee with milk. You know, they, they, this, this soy latte generation. But that sort of stuff is really effeminate. Don't get caught up into that stuff where, you know, you have the, the fancy hairdos and stuff like that. And sometimes you see preachers like that. God forbid that the people that are to be example to God's people uh, follow those sort of trends. So that's why this sermon is going to focus mainly on how females dress because I think it's very important how females dress because... You know, that, that fem- you know, females are what guys lust after. You know, guys struggle with how females dress. And when we want to have a godly atmosphere, we want to set an example here in our church. So it's very important that we understand what it means to dress modestly and principles uh, in how to determine what is modest dress. Now, the first verse we're going to go to is in Philippians 4. We're going to, then we're going to go to Romans 14. But in Philippians 4, the Bible says here, Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. I just think it's interesting how this verse is phrased because the Bible says, hey, what should be known about you as a Christian is how moderate you are. So what what is moderation? Moderation is when you don't do things too extravagant and you don't do things too too cool either. So when you're moderate, it's not too much, it's not too little. Now normally, people are known by their extravagance, aren't they? If you think about people, they're known by their extravagance, you know what sort of points out about them. The Bible's saying here that the Christian ought to be known by how moderate they are. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. So if we were to look at what defines Christianity in terms of how you know how we live in this world we should be a moderate people why because the lord is at hand you see we shouldn't be overly concerned with our appearance with our material possessions with our careers and our businesses you know what we ought to be zealous about what we ought to be zealous about is spiritual things we're zealous about spiritual things but when it comes to material things with our appearance it's moderation 
Because one day God is coming back and everything's going to be gone. All right, so the first topic we're going to look at is doubtful disputation. So just to lay the groundwork for the application today, which is dress standard. The Bible calls the topic of dress standards things that are disputable but are not definitive a doubtful disputation. So that's what a doubtful disputation is. A doubtful disputation is, a, is an area of the Christian life that is debatable. It's an area of the Christian life that doesn't have a definitive answer. And therefore, we have scriptures that we bring together to guide our decisions, to guide our principles, to guide our position, but we don't necessarily have a scripture to define our position. Right? So we have principles, but it's not a definitive position on that topic. So let's go to Romans 14, because Romans 14 we see two examples of what a doubtful disputation is. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So we see here one example of a doubtful disputation is what is good or bad to eat, what is right or wrong to eat. And we're given the example here is somebody who's a meat eater and somebody who's a vegetarian. For one that believeth he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So you have some people that, you know, even in the Christian faith, they think, well, God made us as vegetarians in the beginning and that's what he intended and we really shouldn't be eating meat and meat is not good for you. And people have reasons, even scriptural reasons, why they have that position, why they don't want to eat meat. Now, Paul here is making the point that the person who doesn't think that they should eat meat is weaker in the faith. Why? Because in the New Testament, we're told that we can eat meat. I mean, Jesus ate meat. He cooked fish for the disciples. But some people have this view that they shouldn't be eating meat, and that's what God didn't intend, or whatever reason they have. And that's the example that's given here, is whether or not it's right to be a vegetarian or not. Let him that eateth, let him, let not him that eateth, despise him that eateth not. So what is the Bible saying here? If somebody chooses to be a vegetarian, that's their conviction. We shouldn't condemn that person for their choice. Obviously, it's not, there's nothing wrong with trying to convince them otherwise, but we don't necessarily have to condemn them for that practice and say, hey, you're in sin. You're not right with God. Let's continue. Um, and let not him which eateth not so likewise, the other way, the person who decides to be a vegetarian shouldn't be condemning of the people that choose to eat meat. Why? Because this is an area of doubtful disputation. Eateth not, judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. So now we start to go into another example of a doubtful disputation. So one is whether or not it's okay to eat meat. The second one is holidays. How many people and Christians argue over whether it's okay to celebrate Christmas? The Jehovah's Witnesses are a, a, a perfect example of a cult that says, hey, you can't celebrate a birthday. You can't have any, you can't have any fun at all. You know, you want to celebrate a birthday, you want to celebrate an anniversary, like these are just all pagan things. But well, the Bible's saying here, no, one man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. So some people put days aside and say, hey, we're going to celebrate this or we're going to put this day aside for God. Christmas and Easter are a great example. And there are people out there that will condemn people for celebrating Easter, condemn people for celebrating Christmas. Right? But the Bible clearly teaches that there's, there's not a definitive position. If you want to celebrate Christmas and remember the birth of Jesus Christ on the 25th of December, that's fine. And if you don't want to celebrate Christmas, if you think there's a problem with it and you don't want anything to do with Christmas, you don't want anything to do with Easter, you think they're all pagan, that's fine as well. The Bible says here, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And I've underlined that because that really is the crux of a doubtful disputation. When there is an area in the Christian life that is not definitive. Yes, you can have scriptures that help you build your convictions, build your position, give you a reason why you do things. But is that a reason why nobody can do these things? No, because sin, definitive commandments from God is what 
is allows us to say, no, you can't do it. But doubtful disputations are principles that you apply to yourself to say, hey, this is the reason why I'm not going to do it. Now, you can try and convince others. You can say, hey, if you agree with me, I can try and persuade you in your mind. Do you see? So a doubtful disputation is when you have principles and the Bible says, here, hey, you need to be persuaded in your own mind. As you build your position, your convictions, as long as you're persuaded, that's the position you should take. You should never go against your conscience, what you are persuaded of. But likewise, what you are persuaded of does not set the commandment of God to other people. But what we do when we discuss these issues, when we discuss celebrating Christmas, how we're going to dress, what things we're going to involve our family in, you know, what we're going to eat. You know, some people still believe in the New Testament, even though it not, may not be, you know, we don't believe it's a sin. They still think, hey, there are certain animals you shouldn't eat. There are certain things you shouldn't eat. So this is why the Bible touches on things. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So you see how everyone has good intentions. Everyone's, see, the, 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 the assumption here is everyone's trying to do what's right by God, but sometimes people have different convictions and they come to different positions that are of opposition to one another. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, whether we die, uh, whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord. So, see, in the area of doubtful disputations, he's saying, whatever you choose, you ought to be living for God regardless. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'll just skip through this for a bit and get to the point. So now we go on to here. He says, let us, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. So this judge here is not a discerning type of judge. Like there's nothing wrong to say, hey, that person does this. I don't think it's right for these reasons. It's when you can, this sort of judge that is talking about in Romans 14 is when you condemn somebody. You say, hey, that person's in sin. That person's not right. You know, you just write them off. This is the sort of judging that is talking about in Romans 14. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block on our occasion to fall in his brother's way. So another principle we learn in Romans 14, yes, these, there are areas of doubtful disputation, but as we build our positions, we build our convictions, we think about how we act and behave and dress as a Christian, we don't just ignore totally how our actions affect other people. This is what it's talking about here. So yes, right? You don't want to judge your brother. You have, there are doubtful disputations, but this is what you ought to consider, that you don't put a stumbling block on an occasion to fall in his brother's way. And this is especially important when it comes to the way women dress. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in of itself, Right? So it's not saying that in and of itself there are certain things that are unclean, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So this is what I do want you to take note of especially. Remember when in Romans 14 it said, let every man be persuaded in his own mind? When it comes to judging doubtful disputations for yourself, the Bible says here, hey, if you think it's wrong, if you esteem it to be unclean for you, then it is unclean. So that's one principle we can take from Romans 14 is that if you are persuaded that it's wrong, if you think what you are doing is not right to do, it doesn't matter if it's a doubtful disputation, it is wrong for you. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. So you see how there's two issues here. One is, are you fully persuaded? Do you, when you do this thing, the way you dress, are you actually persuaded that you are doing the right thing? The other thing is, are you considering other people? Because if you don't consider them at all, the Bible says you're not walking with charity. You're not thinking about your fellow brother or sister in Christ. Whether it's being a stumbling block to your brother in Christ, or whether it's being a bad example to the sisters in Christ. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. See, you can 
you can do something that's not necessarily bad in of, of itself, but sometimes you may be seen as not caring about what is right to do, and then your good may be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, but joy in the Holy Ghost. We're going to go jump a bit down here. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offence. Now what does that mean to eat with offence? We'll see later it's when you're actually doing things for the purpose of making people stumble. Now that is wicked, especially when it comes to the issue of dress. Let's say a woman dresses and she knows boys are going to look at her. She knows it accentuates her features and she knows she's going to cause men to lust after her. This is what this verse is talking about. It's evil for that man who eateth with offence. See, if somebody is eating something and he knows it grieves his brother and he's doing it to offend his brother, that is an evil thing. It is evil for that man who eateth with offence, to give offence. Now, sometimes you do things and people take offence. Right? You can't control when people take offence, right? because that's up to them whether they take offence or not. But what you can control is whether you do things giving offence, doing things intentionally to cause people to do wrong. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he allowed. What is that talking about? That's talking about esteeming things to be unclean. Right? You don't condemn yourself in the things that you allow yourself to do. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. Look at this. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So you see how as he's teaching on the topic of doubt for your disputations, the theme keeps coming up. Hey, if you think it's wrong, if you are not fully persuaded, if you are doubting when you do something, if you don't do it of faith, why, that you actually believe that it's right to do, you are sinning. The second thing is, is if you do not consider other people in your decision, if you don't consider how your actions affect other people, how your example is to the world, how you are representing Jesus Christ in this world as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, that is another sin on your part. Now James says it the other way, right? So here we have whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So what we're being taught here is if you believe it's not right and you do it, you're in sin in the areas of doubtful disputation. James 4 says it the other way. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So you see how it's said the opposite way around. One is saying, hey, if you think something is wrong to do and you do it, it's sin. This is saying, hey, if you know that there is something good to do, there's a better way to do it, and you don't do it, to you it is sin. Now let's jump over to 1 Corinthians 10 as we lay this groundwork and then we'll go through some practical examples in the area of modest dress. 1 Corinthians 10 is where we learn the other principle where where you're fully persuaded, it's how your conscience is swayed. Every man has a conscience, right? It's, it's, your own, it's, a, it's something you have that tells you innately whether you're doing something right or wrong. Why? Because the law of God is written on your heart. That's why sometimes when you do things, even though you don't necessarily know it's wrong, you feel bad. Because that, that, that guilty conscience, your conscience is what convicts you. And this is what we learn about in 1 Corinthians 10, how we can judge doubt areas of doubtful disputation by our own conscience. What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? So again, it's talking about eating things sacrificed to idols. So this is the doubtful disputation here. Now, people might say, well, how can, how can you eat things that are sacrificed to idols? You know, I personally would not eat things sacrificed to idols, but this is an area of doubtful disputation. And Paul explains why it's an area of doubtful disputation. Because he says... What say I then? That the idol is anything? Is he saying when somebody carves out a statue into the shape of a man or an animal and then worships it and thinks that it has some sort of supernatural power, does that give it supernatural power? No, it's still a statue. It's still nothing. And that's why Paul says, I mean, what is an idol? It's nothing. So what is it that which is sacrificed to idols? Does it change the food? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. So this is the problem, he's saying here, with, nest, with eating things that are sacrificed to idols. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. 
So you see, it's not that the, anything changes with the food. If you eat something, you don't even know it's sacrificed to idols. It's not that you've sinned. But if you actually go to a different you know, worship and they're sacrificing things to devils and you sit and eat with them, the problem there is you are fellowshipping with devils now. Just like here. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. So this all things that he's talking about, it's not just everything. People, sometimes people take this verse and they just think, hey, see, nothing's a sin anymore. No, no. All, the all things that it's referring to in the context are, is the area of doubtful disputations, right? And in, specifically, you know, the fact that you can eat anything here. But we can use this principle in the area of doubtful disputations. All things are lawful for me. What does that mean? That there are things that I can do in the area of doubtful disputations that are not necessarily sinful in and of themselves. But all things are not expedient. See, it doesn't mean everything is good to do just because it's not sinful to do. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. So you see how we go back to Romans 14. We're considering other people. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So what is shambles? Shambles is an old word for like a marketplace. You know, like I say, you go to a street market and you're just eating things and you're just trying this and trying that. Somebody, you know, maybe your mate goes and buys you some satay sticks, right? And you bring it, he's like, hey, try these satay sticks. And you're like, oh, great, this, these are really good. And then you find out later that, oh man, that shop was actually sacrificing it to Buddha, sacrificing it to an idol, you know? He says, you don't ask. You, don't, you just eat it, asking no question for conscience sake. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go. So this is the, this is the difference now. Whatsoever is set before you, eat, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So somebody might invite you over for a dinner and then put some food before you and you just eat and you're like, that's fine. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice to idols, Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. So he's saying the situation has changed now. Now you know this is sacrifice to idols. You are sitting partaking of a meal that has been sacrificed to idols. The guy that has invited you has told you this is sacrifice to idols. So now you decide, do I want to partake at the table of devils? And he's saying, hey, for his sake, you don't want to do it because he thinks that you're partaking of his God's meal. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So you see how it's his conscience is saying that it sacrifices devils. And he's saying, hey, it's because of his conscience I'm not going to eat because his conscience is free. He says, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Because his conscience is clean. His conscience, hey, it doesn't matter if it's sacrificed to idols. It doesn't affect me. But if he tells me it's sacrificed to idols, I'm not going to eat it because I don't want to ruin his conscience. Judged of another man's conscience. For I, if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now this ties in with considering other people because not only do you want to consider your brother or sister in christ when you do things in the area of doubtful disputations you want to consider god as well because ultimately like it said in romans 14 whether we live or whether we die we are we live for the lord and this is what it's saying here hey whatsoever you do even if it's something as mundane as eating and drinking you need to consider god in everything that you do Verse 32, give none offence. You remember Romans 14, it says, He that eateth with offence, give none offence, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit. See, some people have the mentality when it comes to doubtful disputations, well, it's none of your business. It doesn't matter what other people think. No, it does matter what other people think. That's, that is a factor that needs to be taken into account in the way you dress. It does matter what, how other people perceive you, what other people think, and your effect on other people. 
not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So this, obviously, in the context of him trying to save Jewish people, right, and not wanting them to partake of devils as they eat things offered to idols. Now let's apply what we've just learned. So the three principles that we learned there, I think I had pre three, is one is, if you remember in Romans 14, if in the area of doubt for disputation, if you believe it's wrong to do and you do it, that's a sin. Also in the area of doubt for disputation, if you think there is a better way or a right way to do things and you don't do it, that is sin. You need to be fully persuaded in your own mind. And the last is you need to consider others in your decision. How you dress, you need to consider how you're perceived, how you may be lusted after by other guys, and, and in your example to other women. Because ultimately, the Bible says, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So let's apply now, because we're specifically looking at the area of doubtful disputation, which is clothing. Clothing, giving you principles on how to dress modestly. So I'm going to give you three ways that you can dress immodestly, and then we're going to look at four different factors that might sway your conscience in, in regards to how you dress immodestly. Now let's look first at the principle. Let's look at the commandments in the Bible to actually dress modestly. 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves. What, it, what does it mean to adorn yourself? It's how you present yourself, how you make yourself beautiful. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. So no, there's no question about whether it's right to dress modestly. So that's the principle we're given in the Bible. That is definitive, that we ought to dress modestly. And the reason why it is directed mainly at women is because when men are overly concerned with how they dress, it's an effeminate attribute. It's a feminine attribute. So that's why the Bible talks about women considering how they dress, and there's no question that we ought to dress modestly. Now, how do we dress modestly? Well, this is what the sermon's about. It's giving you principles on how to determine modest dress. With shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls, a costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now the parallel passage is in 1 Peter 3 where we're, there's more instruction to the women of how they are to present themselves and how they are to behave. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So you see how like there are things about you that are visible. And yes, things of the heart are visible, but also the way you dress, right? The way you present yourself is visible. Coupled with fear. Who's adorning the way you make yourself beautiful? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. See, so what this scripture is teaching you here is, ladies, what you should be focused on in making yourself beautiful, in adorning yourself, is not the outward appearance. It's not how fancy you can make your hair, or how expensive and fancy your clothes can be, or how tight you can get them. No, it's about the hidden man of the heart. That's what should make a woman beautiful in the eyes of God and in the eyes of Christians, not the outward appearance in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. You see a woman who is meek and quiet and subject to her own husband is a beautiful thing in the eyes of God and is of great price. It is a valuable thing. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, I've put this uh, table together. And I'm going I'm to build out this table, and hopefully it gives you a visual on what I'm preaching on and how you can determine what is modest dress. So first, we're going to fill in these first three. Three ways you can be immodest, and then these four are going to be 
four factors that sway your conscience. And each of the factors can apply to the different ways you can be immodest. So the first one we're going to look at is clothing. Because one way you can be immodest, one way you can dress immodestly, is that you are drawing attention to the clothes themselves. Right? So when we talk about immodest dress, yeah, one is women dressing too, you know, I guess the word can be slutty, right, or whorishly. And we're going to talk about that one too. But the first one we're going to talk about is dressing in a way where you actually draw attention to the clothes themselves. Now, we look at 1 Timothy 2, the Bible says in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. What is sobriety? Sobriety means you dress in a way where you are serious, grave, sober, sobriety. So what is a way a woman can dress immodestly and not sober? Well, it's the woman that has her hair up all fancy pink and different colours. You know, women that wear the... And the obviously, you know, like I said, there's a doubtful disputation. So there's nothing definitive. I can only share you verses and give you my opinions and how my conscience is swayed. And hopefully, you know, you take some of this advice on board, some of this wise counsel, and, and apply that to your own principles, apply the, these principles to your conscience that you are equally persuaded in the same way. But you know what I'm talking about when people dress and they look like they're a joke? You know, like, like women that might wear like all these sparkly boots and then the striped, you know, stockings. And, and you look at them and you honestly think you are dressed like a joke. That's what the Bible's talking about. Sobriety. When you think about how you, when you put your clothes on, is somebody going to look at you and think, you're an absolute joke. You're a dro joke of a human being. You have, no, you have no sobriety in how you dress. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. This is First Peter. In that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So you see how God wants women to have a spirit of meekness and quietness. So if you think of how that applies to clothing, you don't want clothing that's too loud, that stands out too much, right? A woman should be seeking to sort of, you know, not be at the forefront, at the centre of attention, right? And like with the way she speaks, meek and quiet spirit, it also should be in the way you dress. You want to be meek and quiet. You want to have an attitude or a spirit of meekness and quietness. So bright, think about, you know, over-the-top colours, over-the-top accessories. You know, you, maybe you wear a hat to work and it's just this huge fancy hat. And it's just like, you know, why is it just so over the top? Or, you, you know, a, a classic example is, you know, women that go to a funeral and then they're wearing bright colours, fancy colours. It's, it's just so out of place. It's not sober. It's not suitable for that occasion. That's an example of clothes that draw attention to yourself. What's the second way you can dress immodestly? Is clothes that draw attention to your wealth. Clothes that draw attention to your wealth. This is a way you can dress immodestly as well. Look at this, the outward adornment, plating the hair, wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel. And let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. I wanted to show you here in Timothy, I might have missed that slide in my notes. But in, second, in 1 Timothy 2 here it says, not with broidered hair, gold, pearls or costly array. So you see another way you can dress immodestly is if you're dressing in a way that you're just trying to show people how rich you are. Now I always wondered when I was a younger Christian why broidered hair would be here? Why would it be in line with gold, pearls and costly array? And then I found out how much women spend on their hair. You know, like I remember my ex-girlfriend once when I was younger. She went and got her hair straightened and then when she told me how much it costs? It literally costs like three or four hundred dollars. And I'm like, serious? That costs three or four hundred dollars? All the chemicals and the straightening? And I knew this girl at work who straightened her hair and then she had to wash her hair. And as soon as she washed her hair, it just went back frizzy. So it's like three hundred, four hundred dollars is gone. So, you know, girls do all sorts of things to their hair. I'm sure, I'm sure you girls know. And how expensive it is. How much money is spent on hair. So when you have a fancy hairdo, that's, that's a lot of money that goes into that. Or gold, obviously gold, pearls, jewels, costly array, it's expensive clothing. What we see here in 1 Peter 3, you see how it's contrasted with wearing expensive things, and then the Bible says here, you want to be an ornament, you think about an ornament, it's like an antique, something precious, 
this is of a meek and quiet spirit look at this which is in the sight of god of great price see are you trying to show others how much money you have show others how expensive you look on the outside or are you trying to show god how valuable you are be be something of great price to god um let's go on so we have clothing things that draw attention to your own clothes things that draw attention to your wealth you know fancy hairdos handbags is a big one you know getting the gucci handbag or the lv handbag you know getting something so so people can see you've got nice things or collector shoes i remember i went shopping once with an old friend and she took me to she took me she showed me these shoes that she really liked and they were literally just like these black flats and i'm just like aren't those ones just like the ones you can buy for like 15 or 10 bucks and she's like no it's like these are like this specific brand and i'm like so it's this specific brand that makes them like three or four hundred dollars when they look exactly the same and they're literally just like plain black flats and i'm just like i can't believe these are so expensive but women they have their shoe collections don't they and the bible says you ought not be spending money on all this costly array now the last one and i think this is probably because i don't know how much of us are really affected by these ones this one's important because this one affects guys this one affects you know your example you set in the church this one gives the impression that when people walk into our church how are people dressed that's the first thing people see right so when people come into our church what they see first is how people are dressed all right the second thing they they realize is when people talk to them the friendliness of people that's why this is important it's not that it's not that it's more important that's what's in the heart or what's fun, funnily enough what is in the heart obviously comes out sometimes in how we dress and how we present ourselves so the last way we can dress immodestly is that we wear clothes that draw attention to our body we wear clothes that draw attention to our body now i'm not preaching this you know i know some of you guys came in a bit late but i'm not preaching this because i'm upset with anybody it's i'm preaching it for one person you know some people just don't know these principles are in the bible so i'm just preaching this so people know how when they decide i'm going to put some clothes on what are some principles i have in the bible to help me guide those decisions so that when i look at myself in the mirror i think hey this is something that is pleasing to god so another way we can dress immodestly is drawing attention to our body look what the bible says here in proverbs 7. the bible says here in the twilight in the evening in the black and dark of night see when people want to do things that are wrong people that want to do things that are sinful they do it at night they do it in the darkness and behold there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart now how can the bible use this phrase that there's a woman dressed like a prostitute if prostitutes just wear the same things that everybody wears because that's what it looks like today right it looks like today when you see women dressed and then you go and look at the prostitutes sometimes you don't see a difference prostitutes are wearing tight clothes christian girls are wearing tight clothes prostitutes are wearing short skirts christian girls are wearing short skirts prostitutes wear you know high cut you know low cut shirts christian girls are wearing high cut skirts and low cut shirts so there is a there ought to be a difference between the way a prostitute is dressed and the way a christian girl is dressed and the bible says hey there are women out there that are dressed with the attire with clothing that makes them look like a prostitute now what is a prostitute when a prostitute stands on a corner and she's dressed in a way what is she trying to do she's trying to draw attention to her body right you don't see a prostitute on the corner and she's dressed like a muslim you know with a, what is i can't remember what it's called the hijab is that called the hijab where it's like the full full run she's not there we're dressed with a hijab where you can't see what sort of woman is under there because most people want to sleep with a prostitute they want to sleep with a slender sexy girl right not with an overweight girl so she's not going to hide those things so when you think of how a harlot is dressed a harlot is dressed in a way that accentuates her body that's marketing her body so that men will want to lust after her and sleep with her the bible says in first timothy 2 in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel look at this with shame facedness 
we got to get back to a place in Christianity where women have a bit of shame. People have shame to see your nakedness, to see too much of your body. There was a there was a time when women were shameful of that, right? They would cover up their breasts. They would, you know, wear longer clothes. They would wear looser clothes so that they would have some shame in people being able to see too much of their nakedness. The Bible says here, while they behold your chaste conversation. Now, conversation here isn't talking about the way you talk. Your conversation is your lifestyle. So it's people seeing your lifestyle. Is it chaste? Like when you think of a loose woman, a woman that sleeps around, they dress a certain way as well. So the Bible talks about here, hey, you want to you dress in a way that is pure, that is chaste. You don't want to look like a woman that is loose in terms of just a woman that sleeps around. So we have different examples, right, as we go to uh, this, <coughs> this table. Three ways that you can dress immodestly. One is... Clothing that draws attention to themselves. The clothing itself. Clothing that draws attention to your wealth. Clothing that draws attention to your body. And I want to just give you a few other examples that I think are, are, are things that are immodest. You know, people might ask, because I personally don't think wearing pants for a woman is, is a sin. You know, I'm, I'm not of that persuasion when it comes, because that I believe is another doubtful disputation that I'm not going too in depth in this sermon. But you might ask, well, but why, Victor, if, if wearing pants is not necessarily a sin, why do you always see Elizabeth wearing a skirt? Well, the reason why Elizabeth wears a skirt is because our conviction is, in general, she should be dressed modestly, and a, and a skirt is more modest than pants on a woman, right? Because you can obviously see the buttocks area and the crotch area easily, more easily when a woman is wearing pants. So that's why my, woman, uh, my, woman, my wife uh, wears, wears a skirt. And that's why her conviction is the same as well. That's why she wears a skirt more often than not. So this is where I would definitely rule out yoga pants. You know, a lot of women wear yoga pants. I don't know how, how any woman from a conscience can justify that wearing yoga pants is modest apparel when it's skin tight. I mean, if I came to church wearing yoga pants, what would you guys think? You guys think, this guy's a joke. What's this guy? Want to show me his crotch? Want to show me his butt? That's what you're saying when you wear yoga pants is look at my crotch, look at my butt, and that's why yoga pants, I don't know if there's any argument at all that yoga pants are Im immodest. So yoga pants is an example. Low-cut shirts is another example. You know, and I'm not saying, see, I don't want to define what everybody wears. You know, people think when you become a, an independent Baptist, then you have to wear the polo shirt and the, the long denim skirt. That's like the, the Baptist uniform for a lady. No, 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 I'm not going to tell you what to wear. I don't want to give you specific garments of what to wear, but I think there are specific garments that are, that are right. And, and low-cut shirts. Low-cut shirts, high-cut pants, uh, high-cut skirts. So when you sit down and you're constantly having to pull down your skirt, that's a good indication that it's too short. Well, you know what? If you can't lean for something without showing everybody your breasts, that's another indication that your shirt is too short, it's too low. And that, that, that I think, is a big problem with ladies that they don't think about. Yeah, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you think, my breasts are covered. Yeah, but when you're eating lunch and you're, you know, you're dealing with your kids, you're showing your breasts to everybody. And that's being immodest. Low-cut shirts, front and back. High-cut skirts. Tight clothing. This is another one I think that you guys should take on board, is tight clothing. Now, we talked about wearing yoga pants. Let's say I came in like a full body suit and it was skin colored. You could say, well, well, Victor's not showing his nakedness. Do you think I'm being immodest? You know, dressing in colors that make it look like I'm naked? You know, make it look like, you know, I'm just standing there without any clothes on. So it's the same with tight clothing. Yeah, your features may be covered, but are your clothes so tight that your clothes may as well not be there? That is a problem as well. That is a way you can dress immodestly. You know, my wife brought up a good point as well. You know, like women, they might wear a, wear a, a shirt because there are different cuts of shirts as well. So a woman might wear a, wear a shirt where 
But cleavage is covered, right? So it goes up to here. But then there are different cuts of shirt as well. And some shirts will just fall over, you know, fall over the chest area and just come down and they'll be loose. But there are other shirts, because a woman might say, well, I'm wearing a shirt, you can't see my cleavage, but the shirt's like this. It's like fully like just, you know, wrapped in underneath her breasts and it's just like you're right there. And to me, it's the same thing. You know, when you just wear it so tight that, you know, people can see the outline of your breasts anyway. To me, that is immodest, immodest. The last one I want to talk about just in terms of drawing attention to your body is you need to think about the patterns on your clothes as well. The patterns on your clothes. Because I've seen women's dresses where, okay, maybe the dress doesn't look so bad, but have you seen those dresses where it purposely has lines that just like lead up to the breasts or lines that accentuate the buttocks area? They're there for a reason, guys. Don't be so naive. Women, don't be so naive and think, oh, you know, I, I buy this outfit and it just looks cute on me. No, th there are outfits that are made to, to make men look at your buttocks, look at your breasts, and look at your crotch area. And I believe these things are immodest, and I think you should as well. Now let's go on. I don't want to berate that point too much, but three ways that you can dress immodestly. Now let's look at some factors that can affect your conscience. This is point number three. I'm going to go over four factors that can affect your conscience and areas where you can apply them to the different ways you can dress immodestly. Now the first factor that might affect your conscience is authority. Now what do I mean by authority? Authority is, am I even allowed to wear this piece of clothing? So when it comes to authority, the Bible says here in Ephesians 5, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So these are obviously things outside of sins, outside of the commandments of God. But in everything outside of the commandments of God, the wife should be subject to her husband as the church is unto Christ. Now think about this. To what degree is the church subject unto Jesus Christ? In every area. There's no area where the church is not subject unto Christ. And the Bible is telling us here that this is how a wife should be subject to her husband in every area of life. That includes how you dress. Look, it says here in Ephesians 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So, when it comes to authority, you can ask yourself the question, well, does the authority figure in my life? Would he even allow me to wear this? You may go to the shops and go, oh, my dad would never let me wear this. And then you buy it anyway. You're in sin. Because you know that if your dad had the choice, he would say, don't wear this. What if you put on something and, you're, and, you're, and you know, your parents go, you're not putting that on, and then you go out of the house wearing it anyway? That's sin, because you're going against your parents' authority. What if, you, what if your dad, like say, lives in another country, and you go and buy something and you think, you know what, I don't think my dad would like me wearing this. He hasn't specifically said anything, but you know he would have a problem with it. You know your husband would have a problem with you wearing that. Well. If your husband thinks that it violates one of these areas, or if your parents think it violates one of these areas, that's where it would be a sin for you. Authority. Let's go on to the second one. A second factor that can affect whether how you dress is a sin is your motive. Your motive. What do I mean by your motive? Why are you dressing that way? Why are you dressing in a way that makes people look at you? So you know your own heart. You can judge this, you can judge this one perfectly because you know yourself whether you are dressing in a way to draw people to your clothing, to draw people to your wealth, or to draw people to your bodily features. And, you know, this is where people that want to dress immodestly get all spiritual, right? And they say, oh, yeah, but it doesn't God only care what's in the heart? He only cares what's in the heart, right? As though what's on the outward appearance doesn't matter. No. Look at what Jesus said here to the scribes and the Pharisees. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So you see how God is not only concerned with cleaning the inside of you, he also wants to clean the outside. And the Bible says here that out of the heart of men proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. So you see, the heart is a reflection of how you present yourself. Yeah, you, you can't always tell exactly what's on a person's heart by their outward appearance, but you know what? You get a good indication of it. Because the Bible says it's out of the heart the mouth speaketh. Out of the heart is how you present yourself. Look at what the Bible says here. This should ought to be our main motivation, right? And we learned this today in Bible Club. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you see here, our motive ought to be to please God as we saw in 1 Corinthians 10. And we read here in Romans 14 that we are looking after our neighbor as well. We don't want to, we judge this rather not to put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in our brother's way. We need to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So when you think about your motive, are these things being considered? Is your motive to please God? See, when you put on your clothes in the morning and you get dressed or you go out at night and you think how you're going to present yourself, are you thinking, I want to be pleasing to God. I want God to look down at me and be pleased with how I'm dressed. I want other men to look at me and be pleased with how I'm dressed, not in a sinful way, but in a spiritual way where they see, hey, this is a modestly dressed woman. Or are you dressing in order to be looked at? Are you dressing in a way in order to draw attention to your body? Are you dressing in a way in order to draw attention and have men lust after you? So you need to, you need to consider these things. Let's look at the third one. The third one is, and this is where it starts to get grey, because these really are cut and dry. If, if somebody in authority over you says, don't wear that, easy decision to make, right? If your authority thinks that it violates one of these three, it's gone. If you wear it, it's a sin. You know your own heart. You know that if you are wearing something to achieve one of these rather than to please God or to be a good example to other people. So again, this one is easier to judge, isn't it? Because it's quite definitive in terms of your own conscience. This is where I think this, this one starts to make, give situation to these ones. A little bit different and we'll go through why now when the bible says not to wear certain things i personally don't believe it's saying in every instance because i do think there are situations like we talked about where it does warrant maybe wearing something costly wearing gold right there are certain situations or instances where it's okay i mean i'm wearing gold right now is that immodest no, because I think there are situations where it's okay if you're married and it's something that represents your marriage. So what I believe the Bible is teaching when it talks about these specific things is it's saying your life in general, your conversation in general, your lifestyle should be accentuated by these. Not that, that in every instance there is never a place for them. And I'll talk about some examples in what I, uh, what I think it's talking about. First Timothy 2 gives us a context of the passage in 1 Timothy 2 for women. It says, For kings and for all that in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So you see, your life in general ought to be accentuated by modesty. Look at what it says here in 1 Peter 3, that it's the conversation of the wives, the lifestyle of the wives. So let's go back to number three, which is situation. And I'll give you some examples that I think. 
can change your convictions on these three. So first of all, you might say, okay, well, is Victor saying there's never a time to wear clothing that draws attention to the clothing? No, because I do think there are situations where it's not immodest to wear clothes that draw attention to themselves. And here's one example. One example is a fancy dress party. Let's say you go to a fancy dress party and the occasion calls for people to dress in a way that draws attention to their clothes because you're going there, you're having fun to see how people dress. See, to me, I don't think that's sinful for a Christian to go to a fancy dress party dress fancy. Why? Because you're not being, I don't think you're being immodest anymore. Why? Because it's suitable for that occasion, right? Another one might be like a public protest or something that you do publicly for a marketing ploy. You know, maybe you work for a marketing company and there's a public stunt and, you know, somebody dresses in a way that, you know, makes people, you know, draws their attention. I don't think that's necessarily wrong. You know, people dressed as a gorilla on the sidewalk, for example, you know, spinning the sign. Or a public protest, it's all about people trying to see. People might dress a bit fancy in a protest so that they draw attention from the public. That's another example. Uh, what's an example where you may want to wear things that are costly? Think about a wedding. You know, a wedding, you may want to wear, you know, people may want to spend a bit money, more money on a wedding because it's a special occasion. And it's not necessarily seen as something so out there in terms of, you know, buying a nice dress on the day, wearing gold and pearls and jewels, doing your hair up. And the Bible even talks about a bride, you know, being adorned for a husband. I don't necessarily have these in my notes. <clears throat> what's, another what's another example of situation maybe changing even this one? And this is where a lot of debate is in the Christian circle. And this is where you can start to see people's convictions really coming out and their convictions and their standards being applied to other people. So one, for example, where I think you may wear things that accentuate your body, but but your motive and the situation may call for it. And one is competitive sports. Let's say you're a competitive swimmer, or you're a competitive cycler, or you're a competitive runner, and there is a certain attire that gives you a competitive edge. I mean, if, you're, if, you, if you are sprinting, if you're a competitive sprinter, right, and you actually do that competitively, and, and you're trying to win, I mean, you're not gonna be running in a, in a, in a denim skirt and a polo. You know, or if you're a cyclist and you're competing, or same with like gymnastics or even, you know, there's women's sports where there's wrestling and things like that as well. You, you may not necessarily want to wear loose clothing because it, you lose your advantage. Now people that, because this is an area we're talking about doubtful disputations, this is where you can see people's convictions really come through. Because then they'll say something like, well then women shouldn't be doing those sports. You know? It's like when you, when you play a competitive sport, let's say you do cycling and you want to compete competitively, they just think, well, you should be cycling in a skirt because you're not allowed to cycle in, in nicks or whatever. Whereas I personally think, hey, you know, this is a doubtful disputation. Now, would I be caught in nicks? No. I don't, it doesn't matter how competitive that's. I, just, I, 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 wouldn't do, I wouldn't compete to that level because I don't want to wear that stuff. But if somebody wanted to compete to that level, you know, they want to join a fun run or whatever and they actually want to win, I don't think there's a problem with that. You know, there are situations that call for it. Competitive sport. What about swimming and going to the beach? That's a hot, that's a hot topic. You know, some people get to the point where it's like women and men are not even allowed to swim together because you know, when you get wet, you know, they'll say you know, a woman's garments, even if she's fully clothed, right? If she's wearing a skirt and she's wearing a shirt, but when she gets wet, it gets tight. And you, know, you can't have that. So to me, I get what they're saying. I get how it can affect the conscience. See, we're talking about factors that affect the conscience. But some people may say, yeah, but the situation, you know, they're swimming. Let, them have, let people have some fun sometimes. You know, you, they're trying to cover up as much as possible. As long as you are not purposely, you know, you know I could say, I'd say bikini is probably uncalled for. But if you're wearing a, a shirt, you know, you're wearing an undershirt as well so that your breasts don't show through. You're wearing shorts or a longer skirt to go swimming. You know, if your clothes get wet and then you become a little bit more immodest, I think the situation sometimes can call for it because I don't think, it's, I don't think you can just rule women out of every fun thing just because you have to make them dress, you know, 
uh, modestly. So it's the same when it comes to swimming, going to the beach, you know, what you wear. You know, people say like horse riding. Horse riding is one of them. You know, a woman has to wear a skirt when she's horse riding. Sometimes it's more immodest when a woman goes horse riding in a skirt than if she's wearing pants. So this is, that's like a situation where it's actually more modest for a woman to wear some looser pants and go horse riding rather than to wear a skirt. Another one, you know, just, I just want to touch on this, but breastfeeding is one. Breastfeeding is one where people fight about in whether or not it's right to uncover your breasts, to breastfeed your, your child, rather than to cover them all the time um, in terms of breastfeeding. And this is where you have to look at these things. You have to look at these situations and these motives. See, like a woman that says, hey, I'm just going to breastfeed my child. I don't care what people think. Well, she's already in the wrong. because She's not considering other people. Right? Now, does that mean it's necessarily sinful in and of itself to uncover your breasts to feed your child? No. But your convictions may, may conflict because you may say, well, I don't, think, you know, I don't think a woman should ever wear something tight. I don't think she should ever wear something that reveals too much of her breasts or ever wear something that is low cut. And sometimes those same people don't have a problem with a woman literally lifting her shirt up and then just feeding her baby and not caring who sees anything. So to me, that's just a, a contradiction in their own convictions. You know, it doesn't mean necessarily, you know, that they're in sin. They may have their own justification. I just find it inconsistent. So it's like with the situation. You might say, well, you want to cover up, but maybe there's a situation where your baby's hungry, it's hot, you're in a crowded area, and you may have to sneak out the breast to feed your child, and that's not a sin in and of itself. But in terms with my wife and the way our family does it, you know, we generally do cover up. I mean, when you see my wife breastfeeding Noah, she, she usually has a cover on. Now, if it's hot and she has to breastfeed uncovered, you'll generally see her sit in a corner or she'll face away. I personally find the women that breastfeed openly and their attitude is a total disregard to men looking at them, they don't care at all, that's what's the problem. It's the attitude of not caring that people look at you because you're not considering other people, other brothers in Christ. Don't be so naive, guys, to think, oh yeah, you know, people say, oh yeah, but it's a natural thing, you're a pervert if you're looking at a woman breastfeed. It's a breast. It's a breast and it's out. What do you think guys look at? They look at women's breasts and if you take it out to feed your baby, they look at it. It's like people are so silly when they say things like that. They say, well, it's a natural thing. Yeah, well, you know, guys perv on girls. That's what they do, even when they're doing natural things. And if you make it easier for them, you're not considering your brother in Christ. So that's why it's something to consider, but it doesn't mean it's always sinful because the situation may call for it. You know, it's not necessarily sinful to uncover your breasts. Let's look at the last one. The last one is perception. So authority, we talked about motive, is your own heart. Situation, there are different situations that might make these suitable for the occasion. The last one is perception, how you're perceived by other people. The Bible says here, abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, some people take this to the extreme, and that's why I say these are factors that affect your conscience. These are not factors that make it sinful for everybody. Because I remember when I used to learn about dress, the, the emphasis was always, you're going to make your brother stumble. You're going to make your brother stumble. And I believe that is a factor, right? That is a factor that men stumble. But that does not define what sin is. Because guess what? If you had to dress in a way where no man in the, in the world would ever lust after you, you would have to leave the world. Right? Because I'm sure there are men that lust after Muslim women, even though they're under the tent. They probably think, man, her eyes are beautiful. There's probably a sexy body under there too. You know, guys will think of these things, right? Guys have minds like that. So, you can't, you can't, the, a guy's, uh, you know, drive, right, for lust cannot be the factor of what determines how women dress. This needs to be a factor that is considered when women think about how they're going to dress. It doesn't define how they dress. Otherwise, whose perception is going to be the authority? Which men is going to be the authority? You know, maybe you, you, you dwell with a, a people that are a lot more respectable, so you can get a, a, away with a lot more things. 
but maybe you, you dwell with people with men that you know a bit more you know they voice out how they think and, and you might not get away with so much so perception is one that we have to consider now how can you just determine perception how can you figure out well how am I being perceived well this is where you should ask other people you ask other people you ask godly influencers and say hey this is why I'm preaching this sermon I'm giving you some opinions I'm giving you some examples that I believe it is wise that you take on board that these are examples of immodest dress the Bible says a wise man will hear and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels wise counsels so this doesn't mean girls that you take a picture of yourself in the bathroom and then post it on Facebook and then ask your Facebook friends what do you think is this modest and you get all the likes and the thumbs up and the hearts that just shows you know when I see people's Facebook photos sometimes that just shows the heart of a woman you know when you look at when you look at somebody's face you know that's why sometimes I have to unfollow some women right you unfollow some women because all you're getting is like just a modest picture after a modest picture and sometimes these women are like preachers wives and you're just like how does this guy you know like if Elizabeth was just posting photo after photo it's like and, and, the, and the selfie photo has like nothing to do with what they're posting about you know like they'll post a photo of themselves in an outfit and they're like taking the kids to the park you know take a photo of them cooking dinner and it's just like obviously that girl is just so full of herself and doing it to be seen to get the likes that's not how you determine that's that's you should not be doing that girls shall attain unto wise count ask your dad that's why girls have fathers that's why girls have husbands if you don't have those then you can ask godly men in the church hey you want to know how to dress look at the way my wife is dressed you know we're trying to set the example you want to know how I think you should be dressed in church look at the way I'm dressed you know covered shoes pants I think that's suitable for church so like I said before we're just coming to a close here these are the four factors that can affect your conscience in terms of how to dress modestly these ones are quite clear-cut because if your authority says no nah, you're not wearing it that's easy you don't wear it and if you do you're in sin this one is easy as well because if you know you're wearing something for the wrong reason if you're posting that Facebook post for the wrong reason that knows we know as well you know that you know your own heart whether you're breaking one of these ways to dress immodestly these two are where it gets a bit more gray right and people debate over what situations are right and wrong to wear things that draw attention to themselves to, uh, that are expensive or draw, draw attention to your body and how are you being perceived but notice that when you make these decisions you're thinking about God you're thinking about other people and you're thinking about how you're being perceived because if you're just not caring about what other people think you're not caring about the way you're dressed affecting other people and making your brothers stumble then you are in sin because ultimately the Bible says you know whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do do all to the glory of God so I'll just end on this point hopefully that gives you a bit of guidance when you think about how to dress modestly now notice in this sermon I'm just giving you my opinions on what I think is immodest and modest apparel I don't want to necessarily define for you what to wear I'm not giving you a catalog you know I'm not going to come here and say hey here's a catalog of Victor approved wear you know Victor approved swimwear Victor approved church wear Victor, Victor approves sportswear I don't want to define every part of your clothes and I don't do that for my wife either so if you're thinking oh you know Victor just you know the reason why Elizabeth dressed this way is because you know you go into the wardrobe at home and it's just like and it's like Superman it's just got the same skirt the same shirt or you know like yeah hey sometimes there are things in a wardrobe where I think no you're, you're not gonna wear that again but I don't go shopping with her and choose her clothes for her and you know Elizabeth decides her own clothing what Elizabeth is wearing today she decided what she wore. I, I didn't even think about it. I'm thinking about what to preach today so I want you to take away this point that if you're looking for somebody to, to just define what modest clothes are you've missed the point that modest apparel is a doubtful disputation the way you have to think about it and I'll use Elizabeth as an example is 
If you think about how Elizabeth dresses, what goes in her mind is like I taught today. You're going to think about what is pleasing to God. You're going to think about what's pleasing to her husband. And as she gets to know her husband more, she knows what is going to be pleasing to her husband because of things I've said before, things I've taught on, and, and the standards that we set for our own family, that I don't have to dictate her every move. That's how you want to be as a Christian. When you think about how you present yourself, especially ladies, the way you dress, it's not here is a laundry list of the things you can and cannot wear. You want to dress in a way where you think, hey, if I was to go out dressed like this, wearing this, is God pleased with me? Would he be happy with the way I'm dressed? And that is doing all things to the glory of God. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you for the many principles you give us to guide the way we dress. I pray, Lord, that uh, you'd help the ladies to take this on board, um, that they would think about the different factors of how they can dress immodestly and uh, different ways, uh, the different factors that can affect our conscience. So uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. Thank you for teaching us through your word. And I pray, Lord, if at the very least, everything we do, we always try and do something that is pleasing to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.